Say the word AIDS and some people cringe. It makes them feel uncomfortable. It conjures up images they may not want to see. It's something that happens only to homosexual men or drug addicts, not to people like them. But most of the new cases of HIV infection in North Carolina last year appear to have come from heterosexual contact. Is our state doing enough to stop the spread of AIDS? Or is the stigma of AIDS standing in the way? From WRAL News, this is Focal Point. Because of lack of education on AIDS, discrimination, fear, panic, and lies surrounded me. 20 years ago, a 13-year-old boy put a new face on AIDS. Medical treatment has come a long way since Ryan White contracted AIDS in 1984. But what about attitudes? The perception that, that is still, if you got HIV, you deserve it. Because you did something bad. Some say that's making it tough for poor people in North Carolina to get the medicines they need to survive. People that are struggling with this disease should not have to worry about getting access to basic medications. But they do. You're scared. If you don't get any medication, you count the days. If you think being infected with HIV is tough, imagine not being able to pay for the medications you need to keep you alive. Public health officials say providing HIV medications to poor people not only keeps them healthy, but reduces the risk for the rest of us. For the next half hour, our focal point is on a program that does just that. We'll look at the faces of AIDS and examine how price and prejudice may keep HIV medications from getting to the people who need it the most. My name is John Paul Womble. To many people, John Paul Womble is the face of AIDS. I'm also HIV positive. He's a gay man who contracted HIV by having unprotected sex one night when he was 22 years old. I was king of the world. Bulletproof. Bulletproof. And I simply wasn't thinking, and I made a bad decision. When the health worker told me that the uh, test result was reactive, which means that it was positive, she put her hand on my knee and she said, how are you doing? And I said, I'm okay. And she said, well, you're not going to be for long. Just three years before, Womble had watched his father waste away from AIDS before finally committing suicide. I did not know what to do. Um, I thought the world is about to come crashing down upon my head. Um, you know, no one is going to want to be my friend. My family is certainly going to disown me. His family didn't disown him. They supported him. So did his friends. Womble got treatment and got on with his life. We provide treatment education, counseling, housing for folks who are in late stage disease. Now, um, as an AIDS advocate, Womble warns people that when it comes to AIDS, things aren't always as they seem. That's correct. Yes, his late father was a gay white man, but he was also a married Baptist minister. And the bulk of folks that are out there that watch and, and listen to this story and, 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 and mull it over in their head, they're going to think that I'm the face of HIV. Gay, white, man, right? Wrong. It can be the face of a heterosexual black female, too. It can be the face of Lorraine Mitchell. Any face could be the face of AIDS. In her second husband's face, Mitchell saw an old friend who was handsome, charming, and funny. He was just always, you know, a great guy and everybody's pal. They married in 1992. A few years later, when Mitchell was working at Discovery Place Museum in Charlotte, she kept coming down with chickenpox. Among the tests she took at her doctor's office was one for HIV. And it tested positive. And I can, I can remember the day, the time, the doctor's name, everything. I was stunned. I, it was just like he hit me with a truck. Mitchell says her doctors treated her as an oddity. A housewife getting infected, you know, just a plain everyday housewife. And it's like they didn't think of that because it was, everybody was looking for gay white males. Mitchell broke the news to her husband. And, you know, he looked at me like, well, what have you done? And I was like, oh, nobody. <laughs> you know, no, it was not me. I did not do anything. It hurt me so bad, everything that happened, insult on top of injury. You know, it's bad enough that you cheated. It's bad enough you're a drug addict, but then you're going to infect me with something like this. And it was just so much pain. I wanted him to feel the pain that I felt. 
Mitchell is still working through her pain and trying to stay alive. You need this to live. These medications make it possible. This little grouping of pills is called my drug cocktail. Medications keep John Paul Womble alive too. Bottoms up. But not everybody in North Carolina with HIV has such easy access to the medicines they need to survive. There's no reason in the greatest country in the world and one of the greatest states in the United States that anybody should have to face death just because they can't afford to get on uh, medications. Next, why some say that's exactly what's happening to poor people infected with HIV in North Carolina. And I have to look at that person and I have to say, the best advice I can give you is move or die. You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News. In-depth coverage you can count on. There's an interesting paradox in North Carolina. We have one of the highest HIV infection rates in the country. We're also home to many of the companies that make HIV medications. Medications that are the only hope for treatment. But if you're poor, there's no guarantee you're going to be able to get them. Um, I call them my pretty yellow horse pills. These medicines are John Paul Womble's daily drug cocktail. These are poisons. <laughs> You're putting poisons in your body every minute of every day, trying to keep a virus from killing you. The drugs help protect his immune system from HIV. The side effects include jaundice, diarrhea, and loss of feeling in his hands and feet. These pills, as challenging as they are, as expensive as they are, are the only thing that I can take that are gonna keep me alive and make it possible for me to live with HIV. The medications can cost anywhere from 13 to $25,000 a year. If I didn't have health insurance, there would be no way whatsoever for me to have any one of these medications. This is $345.13. Lorraine Mitchell doesn't have health insurance. $583.10. Her medications cost about $1,500 per month. The AIDS Drug Assistance Program, or ADAP, provides them for free. Being on ADAP gives me security. It's a federal program administered by the state. The state matches federal funds to provide HIV medications to the poor. Only five states contribute more money to the program than North Carolina. But North Carolina makes it tougher than most states for poor people with HIV to qualify. Here, a person's income can't be more than 125% of the federal poverty level, or $11,600 a year. The ADAP program. Lorraine Mitchell had to quit a job she enjoyed to qualify. It's definitely catch-22. You know, you, you want to better yourself, but you can't because you're so afraid of getting sick. Mitchell now has a part-time job with a regional HIV AIDS consortium in Charlotte. You know what kind of attendance she was expecting? Its executive director is keeping her hours low to make sure Mitchell remains qualified for the assistance program. You know, if you do a little something and if you go over that magic number, you don't get your medication. Well, I'm not going over that number. I, I need my meds. We don't want to keep people in poverty just so that they can maintain good health. John Paul Womble works for the Alliance of AIDS Services in Wake County. So folks are not going to get their medication. Because the Alliance helps enroll people in the AIDS Drug Assistance Program. As of today, there's still 500 on the waiting list. He remembers a client who was a single mother with two children. She was a custodial worker at a bank but had no health insurance. Best advice I could give her was quit your job and pray that you're going to then be poor enough to qualify for this program. Even though North Carolina spends more money on the AIDS drug assistance program than most states, demand has still outpaced funding because of the state's high infection rate, especially among the poor. In 1997, the state had to create a waiting list for the program. This year it grew to almost a thousand people, becoming the largest waiting list for the AIDS drug assistance program in the country. Without those medications, there's no doubt that people with HIV would progress on to AIDS and, and die. The companies that make HIV medications have programs to provide them to poor patients, but they too are limited, and the application process is complicated by the fact that patients take multiple drugs. This represents three different pharmaceutical companies that the individual would have to go to and get patient drug assistance. For one company, a patient may have to reapply for assistance every month. For another, it may be every quarter. For another, it could be six months. And each company's eligibility requirements may be different. The red tape makes it easy to miss deadlines, and missing deadlines means missing doses. If you take it here and there and, you know, miss a dose here and take it there or something like that, 
then your body can grow an immunity to it and then that's medication that can't be used anymore. Health officials say poor people infected with HIV need to have a reliable source of medications. If they become sick, Medicaid will cover treatment, as it would for other serious illnesses like cancer. But the purpose of the AIDS drug assistance program is to keep them from becoming that sick and to reduce the risk that they will spread the disease to others. Health officials say it's unfair to ask drug companies to bear the burden. But they also say it's unfair to let patients live with the stress of wondering whether they will have the medications they need to survive from day to day. I think they ought to feel the commitment from North Carolina's legislators and our government that we're going to do what we can if they're in need and if they need this medication that we're going to provide it for them. Next, why some say our state is falling through on that commitment. The bottom line is if we don't do something to help folks, they're going to die. And if they die, that's called murder. You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News. In-depth coverage you can count on. State health officials say almost 26,000 people are infected with HIV in North Carolina. Some of them are on the waiting list for the AIDS Drug Assistance Program. Many more don't qualify because they make more than $11,600 a year but still can't afford the medications, which can cost more than twice that. We were able to track down some of those people, but they would not appear on this program. They were afraid of what might happen to them if people found out they have HIV. They were afraid of discrimination. Some say discrimination is the very thing that keeps them from getting the help they need. In 1994, a friend of State Representative Thomas Wright died of AIDS. The friend contracted the disease from his wife. As Wright was leaving the funeral, he heard his friend's mother cry out in anguish and grief. And it was the impact of that, that cry out that just went through me and shocked me into saying, something has to be done about this. Wright learned about the state's income cap to qualify for the AIDS Drug Assistance Program. At 125% of the federal poverty level, it's far lower than the national average of 300%. That's the cap in South Carolina and Virginia. The cap in New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Delaware, which like North Carolina, have high HIV infection rates, is 500%. When you consider the fact that the AIDS drug cocktail was created right here in North Carolina within the research triangle, it just didn't make sense to me that we were denying our citizens who needed access to that medication uh, the opportunity to get it. Wright introduced a bill to double the state's cap on the AIDS Drug Assistance Program from 125 percent of the federal poverty level to 250 percent, or from $11,600 to $23,200 a year so more people could get HIV medications and still hold down a job. I want you to fill out this ADAP form. It could cost the state another 20 to $30 million a year. But Wright says people who are healthy and working cost the state less than people who are sick and unemployed. And that's the reason why I introduced legislation, because I saw the cost associated with it. And in my mind, it just didn't make sense. And it could reduce the state's infection rate. Because when someone is on HIV medications, they have less virus in their system, and so less chance of passing it to others. And as prevalent as a disease is in a community, the more risks people have. Wright has introduced his bill five times, but it has gone nowhere. The message that's being communicated to people living with HIV, get out of our state. We don't want you here. Get out of our state, move or die. All right, what are we doing for you today? While there's no proof anyone has died in North Carolina because they couldn't get help from the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, people have moved to other states to get help. This is now 50 signs. During the last legislative short session, Governor Easley proposed an additional $4.2 million to eliminate the program's waiting list. The legislature approved $2.75 million. That cut the waiting list in half to about 500 people. Yeah, we got to work on these health care exactly. Senator Bill Purcell, who supports funding the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, says the state has many needs and limited funds. You've got to take it from somewhere, and that's, that was a problem we faced, and we did what we thought we could do, and, and realizing that there are people who are not 
being cared for right now. If there's no room left in the pie to take care of all those people, what's my answer? Let's make the pie bigger. You don't have to pick and choose who gets it. The answer is make the pie bigger. Some say prejudice is getting in the way. The Senate will come to order. The sergeant in arms will close the door. There are some folks who are elected to the General Assembly who absolutely think if you are gay and you get HIV, good riddance, you might as well go on and die. There are absolutely folks who think, who are elected to the General Assembly, who think if you're poor and you use drugs and you got HIV, you deserve to die. While we couldn't find any legislators who will say that publicly, we found similar sentiments. On her website, Representative Debbie Clary writes about a state budget that is unfair unless you have HIV AIDS and provides more drug assistance for people who have made poor lifestyle choices than the elderly or disabled. Representative Rex Baker told us, I'm not in favor of funding programs that help those people who choose that kind of lifestyle, and I don't want to help those people. I feel sorry for him. If you're that stupid, that is, you are going to just determine whether someone gets to live or die based on your judgment of what is morally, ethically right and wrong. You know, good riddance. People put them in office because they That's happen to agree true. with absolutely. it. Absolutely true. Both Baker and Clary are among the chairs of the House Appropriations Committee. Both declined our invitation to be interviewed for this program. But Representative Wright has a message for them and other lawmakers who may share their views. I say to my colleague, Get your head out of the sand. Wake up. No one made you God. You can't pass judgment on other people. And it's required of us to help our fellow person. So we have to do that. Wright also points to the numbers. State health records show that in 2003, there were 2,100 newly diagnosed cases of HIV in North Carolina. Clinic reports indicated that 44% were from heterosexual contact, 41% from homosexual contact between men, and 9% from IV drug use. 31% of new cases were women, and 76% of those women were black. I was married. So if you're gonna hang your hat of I'm voting against the ADAP program based on the fact that, that it's funding people who are gay who made a lifestyle decision that they're now paying for, you're wrong. When it comes to access to health care, should someone's lifestyle choice matter anyway? People smoke every day. This is a tobacco state. But we don't deny them medical care because they made a poor choice of smoking. You're watching Focal Point from WRAL News. In-depth coverage you can count on. To learn more about the AIDS Drug Assistance Program and HIV AIDS in North Carolina, visit WRAL.com and click News. More federal money is on the way that should eliminate the rest of North Carolina's waiting list for the AIDS Drug Assistance Program. But the income cap to become eligible for the program will continue to be a roadblock for those people needing life-saving medications. AIDS activists, healthcare workers, and many lawmakers believe this is a public health problem that needs to be resolved. And they say the issue of lifestyle choice has nothing to do with this debate. Oh, John Paul Womble was raised a Christian in the Baptist Church. I was raised that, that we should you know, do unto others as, as you would have them do unto you, to care for your fellow man. Even if your fellow man makes bad choices. I know the risk when I eat fried seafood, which I love dearly. I'm southern born and bred. I mean, I love my fried food. Please don't take it from me. But I know the risk is there but I don't really think it's likely that I'm gonna develop heart disease. I love to smoke, but I don't really think it's likely that I'm gonna get lung cancer. Maybe I took a risk one night and I didn't really think the possibility of HIV was there. In any one of those scenarios, the reality is it's here now for you. You can't blame people for getting sick. And, and once they are sick, then I think what we need to do as a humane and compassionate society is to figure out how to reasonably take care of them. With that, let's get started. Uh, Representative Wright believes his bill to raise the income eligibility cap for the AIDS wow, drug assistance program is a good step in that direction. These are sick people who need, who need help and we have the, I think we have an obligation to, uh, to help them. If that argument doesn't work, Wright believes something else will. 
When it hits their family, then it's a different game. And that's what I tell my colleagues here in the legislature. When it gets close to home, you'll wake up. There are people who believe that they're not going to get it themselves. Their family's not going to get it themselves because they're doing all the right things. Um, but I've seen it happen in families just like those. HIV doesn't discriminate. People do. Representative Wright says seeing his friend die of AIDS was a call to action. Evelyn Faust says her call to action was breaking the news to her first HIV positive client when she was a health clinic worker 20 years ago. His eyes, you know, filled up with tears and my eyes filled up with tears because at that time in 1984, um, I didn't know what to tell him to do. Today, some health care workers in North Carolina find themselves in a similar predicament, not because there are no effective medications available, but because getting access to them can be so difficult. This is a moral issue to you? Sure. Absolutely. And it is a moral issue for me because it's just not okay, it's not acceptable for people to be waiting in line for basic medications to stay alive. I'm a Christian myself. And so I do recall somewhere in Matthew where Christ uh, said, if you've done this to the least of these, you've also done it unto me. My school locker was vandalized inside and folders were marked fag and other obscenities. The legislation that created the AIDS Drug Assistance Program was named for Ryan White. 20 years ago, he contracted AIDS while being treated for hemophilia. He put a new face on AIDS, but the discrimination he faced remains. Some say that's the biggest roadblock to better prevention and treatment. Lorraine Mitchell thinks that it's time once again to put a new face on AIDS, hers.